Hi boys and girls, I'm Miss Gabriel and I'll be reading Pi chapter eight. Charlie lay crumpled on the ground. Alice, who had finally managed to untangle herself from the chair, ran to him. He'll be fine, said Miss Girk, who was squatting down beside him, fanning Charlie's face with her hand. He's fainted. Charlie groaned and opened his eyes. What happened, he mumbled. You fainted, Alice told him, when you saw... She glanced nervously at Miss Girk. Oh, yeah, said Charlie, sitting up and rubbing his head. Now I remember. I was just about to tell Miss Girk she looks exactly like... Miss America, said Alice, quickly jumping in. No, said Charlie. I was going to say she looks like Miss America, Alice insisted. She wasn't about to let Charlie tell Miss Girk that she looked like Charles Atlas or Raging Buffalo or whatever else he'd been about to say. They were in enough trouble as it was without adding fuel to the fire. Do you really think Miss Girk looks like Miss America? Charlie asked Alice. Yes, said Alice, exasperated with Charlie for being so slow to catch on. I really do. Really? Miss America, stop saying that, growled Miss Girk. It's supposed to be a compliment, said Alice. Miss America is a beauty queen. Miss Girk jumped up and strode across the lawn to a canvas laundry bag that was hanging on a chain suspended from the branch of a tree. I know who Miss America is. Do you think I've put myself through hours of hard training to become some mindless beauty queen? She asked as she balled up her glistening fists and began punching the bag. Thwack, grunt. Beauty pageants are insulting to women. Thwack, grunt. Little girls need better role models. Thwack, grunt. Women who aren't afraid to say to the world, ready or not, here I come. Thwick, 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 thwick. She pummeled the bag with a final barrage of rapid fire punches. Then, dropping her fists, she turned and struck a pose her powerful arms curling up at her sides like giant cobras. Does this look like the body of a woman who should be spending her days making sure that lazy, ungrateful little children aren't late for school, she asked. Well, does it? No, ma'am, Charlie and Alice answered in heartfelt unison. That's right, said Miss Girk through gritted teeth, which is why I'm not about to let two nosy little whippersnappers spoil my dream of becoming America's first muscle woman by spilling the beans before I'm ready. We don't want to spoil your dream, Charlie said, and we won't spill the beans about your muscles. Just give Lardo back, said Alice, and we won't say a word. Miss Girk broke her pose. Lardo, she asked. There's no use pretending you don't have him, said Alice. I found your earring under the radiator. What in the world are you talking about? You're the catnapper, Alice said, and you're the burglar too. I have proof. Proof of what, asked Miss Girk, and Alice had to admit she was doing a very convincing job of pretending she didn't know what Alice was talking about. It's all on the shopping list. How else do you explain the band-aids and the sand and the sardines? Alice asked. Not that it's any of your business, but I use sand to fill my punching bag and band-aids to protect my knuckles. As for the sardines, they're high in protein, which is essential for maintaining muscle mass. Is there anything else you'd like to know? Alice knew it was time to play her ace. Why did you reach into Aunt Polly's casket, she demanded. Miss Girk looked shocked. You saw that, she asked, the color draining from her face. Yes, said Alice triumphantly. I saw you take the key. Sorry, Miss Girk, but the jig is up. It was an expression Penny and Sky King used when they cornered a bad guy, but instead of caving in and admitting her guilt, Miss Girk looked even more confused. What key, she asked. I dropped my ring in the casket. Miss Girk reached into the pocket of her robe and took out the diamond ring Alice had noticed her wearing on the day of the funeral. 
It's the vegetable shortening, Miss Girk explained to Alice. It's great for tanning, but it makes you slippery. She slipped the ring onto her right ring finger and tipped her hand to the side to demonstrate how easily it could have slid off. I don't mean any disrespect to your aunt, Alice, but this ring belonged to my late mother, so when it fell into the casket, I couldn't just leave it behind. Alice felt like a balloon with a hole poked in it, the air leaking out with an embarrassing sound. All of the clues that had pointed so clearly to Miss Girk seemed ridiculous now. Maybe we should get going, Charlie said, pushing Alice toward the door. Sorry to have bothered you, Miss Girk. I'll bring you that bag of sand tomorrow, okay? No charge. Not so fast, said Miss Girk. We're not finished here. Ten minutes later, Charlie and Alice rode away on their bikes, but not before they had struck a deal with Miss Skirk that they would keep her muscles a secret. In return, she wouldn't report them to the police for trespassing in her backyard. I'll ride home with you if you want, Charlie told Alice, in case your chain comes off again. That's okay, she said. You don't have to. But he did it anyway. Alice was embarrassed that she had falsely accused Miss Girk, and she felt awful about getting Charlie in trouble. Her Aunt Polly had been wrong. Having an active imagination wasn't a good thing at all. They had only gone a couple of blocks when Alice's chain came flying off again. Maybe tomorrow you should bring your bike over to my house, Charlie suggested. I've got my tools there, so I could fix it for good. You want me to come over to your house, asked Alice. Sure, said Charlie, if you want to. Why aren't you mad at me, Alice asked as Charlie went to work fixing the chain. I don't know, said Charlie. I guess I don't like the way it feels. I'd rather be mad than sad, said Alice. I'd rather be happy, Charlie said. Alice didn't say it, but she wondered if she'd ever feel happy again. When the chain was back in place, she and Charlie got back on their bikes and continued on in silence. It's going to get better, you know, Charlie said after a while. What is, asked Alice, the missing. Aunt Polly was my best friend, said Alice. I'm never going to stop missing her. That's how it was with me and my grandma, said Charlie. She died three years ago and I didn't think I could stand it. I missed her so much, but then I came up with this little trick. What kind of trick, asked Alice. Charlie hesitated. Promise you won't make fun of me? Alice didn't blame him for not trusting her. I promise, she said. I keep one of her old perfume bottles in my drawer. When I really miss her, I close my eyes and take a sniff, and it feels like she's right there in the room with me. Aunt Polly didn't wear perfume, said Alice. That's too bad, said Charlie. After that, they didn't talk for a while. Alice was feeling lower than low. No wonder her mother was so annoyed with her all the time. She probably wished she had a different kind of daughter, a girl more like Nora Needleman, who would want to dress up with her in matching hats. Instead, she was stuck with a daughter who made up dumb songs and ran around accusing innocent people of being catnappers. Alice felt a sad song coming on, but she pushed it away. She'd already made a big enough fool of herself in front of Charlie for one day. As they biked through town, Alice noticed a number of houses with pies cooling out on the windowsills. Was that all anybody in Ipswich cared about anymore? Winning the blueberry? Alice would have traded a million blueberry awards for a chance to spend one more day in the pie shop with Aunt Polly. As she and Charlie turned the corner and headed up the block toward the Andersons' house, Alice was surprised to see a police car parked in the driveway. Uh-oh, said Charlie. Looks like maybe Miss Girk changed her mind and decided to tell on us after all. You go ahead home, Alice told him. The whole thing was my fault anyway. You only went along with it because I made you. But Charlie insisted on coming in with her. I'm the one who pitched you over the fence, he pointed out. Alice's parents were in the living room, sitting next to each other on the couch. Chief Decker was standing behind them with his hand resting on his holster, and sitting on the coffee table was a cardboard box, the top closed with masking tape. It's about time, said Alice's mother, when Alice and Charlie walked in. Where on earth have you been? 
Apparently, Miss Girk hadn't reported them after all. Alice was keeping me company while I made a delivery, Charlie said to Miss Girk. It was the truth, but with a number of important and embarrassing details left out. Alice saw her parents exchange a look. What is it, she asked. It's Lardo, said her father. I'm sorry, honey, but I'm afraid he's, uh, uh, dead, asked Alice, fearing that her horrible day was about to come even worse. Choo! Her father sneezed. No, no, not dead. Then what, asked Alice. See for yourself, Alice's mother said, pointing to the cardboard box. But I warn you, he's not himself. Alice heard a muffled hiss coming from inside the box. He sounds like himself, she said. Dick Carperfew found him wandering around outside the Ipsy Inn, recognized him and called it in, Chief Decker explained. I put him in that box so he wouldn't scratch me. Don't think this changes anything, Alice, her mother said. Regardless of what's happened, he's still going to the pound in the morning. Alice bent over the box and began pulling off the tape. The minute the flaps came loose, Lardo scrambled out and tumbled off the edge of the coffee table onto the floor. Alice's mother had not been exaggerating when she'd said that he was not himself. Lardo's yellow eyes were glazed over and completely crossed. He struggled to his feet and stood swaying back and forth like a sailor on the deck of a rocking ship. Good gravy, cried Charlie. He's drunk.